Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Community Relations uh, Committee meeting. Um, this is an opportunity for all of you to voice your concerns, share ideas. Uh, this is not a regular meeting of the Board of Education. It's an initiative of the committee. And before we start, I'd like to invite all um, the four board, uh, three board members um, to uh, say their pieces. Um, and uh, Virginia, Virginia, you want to say something? OK. Which is like to welcome all of you tonight. And we want you to share your thoughts and concerns with us. Please feel free to express your thoughts so that we know what you are worried about, what you're concerned about, and what you're feeling. Thank you. Hi, I'm Carol Podofsky. The Edison School District has 19 schools with house over 16,000 students who are taught by over 1,000 teachers and hundreds of support personnel who keep the schools up and running on a day-to-day -day basis. Every one of those students matters to us, and so do their families, teachers, paraprofessionals, custodians, and maintenance workers, administrative personnel, lunch aides, librarians, principals, and supervision. We have nine elected boards of education members, hundreds of PTO volunteers, and a community of specialized support staff, security, and technical personnel, as well as an active and as well as an active and concerned village, which is what it takes to raise a child. That is a lot of moving pieces, variables. And wait a minute, 16,000 students. That is more people than I had in my hometown growing up. Some days this boggles my mind. Anyway, we meet again tonight to listen, to try to answer questions, to possibly help, and yet let you know that we are interested and we do care. So hopefully we'll hear from some of you. Good evening, I'm Elizabeth Conway and I'd like to welcome everyone that's attending tonight. I'm hoping that this committee is being beneficial to all those who are interested, whether you're watching this live or you're watching the recorded version. The purpose of us doing this meeting through Zoom is that we can reach as many people that are interested in voicing their opinions and listening to other people's opinions. But I'd also like to suggest that if there are any PTAs, PTOs, PTSOs, PTSAs that are interested, starting in January, if you'd like to have a meeting in person with any of our committee members, we're also willing to do that because we realize the questions that are being brought to us are generic questions that affect the entire district. But sometimes there's questions that you might wanna ask specifically about your school that might deal with you personally. And if there's a way that we can help in any way by relating your concerns to the administration and you would prefer to do it at an in-person meeting, we'd also be willing to come out and greet and meet you also. So if that's a choice and no one has to do it, but we wanna be able to relate to the community in the most ways possible. Thank you. Uh, so I also want to thank Dr. Bregan, who always makes himself available for this meeting. And thank you, Dr. Alderari, for being there. And thank you, Raz Barka, who does all the technical behind the scenes work. Uh, so, um, so just a couple of you know housekeeping issues. So just uh, want to mention that um, I hope um, that you will uh, speak up rather than use the chat. Sometimes the chat gets, um, you know, just very quick and it's hard to kind of follow all the questions. And also it's, it will be helpful if we use the chat only for asking questions, because otherwise um, if a lot of people are talking amongst themselves then you know, we may miss a few, uh, answering a few questions. And um, finally, um, we would request um, folks to um, not ask the same question that has already been answered before. Um, so with that, um, let's start the meeting and, um, you know, raise your hand and we'll, we'll call you in order of uh, when you raise your hand. But before that, I would like to ask Dr. Bregan to give an update on transportation. I know it's on many of your minds and there's been 
a few issues uh, right since the school started and the issues haven't ended. So Dr. Bregan, if you can give an update on that. Absolutely. Thank you, Ms. Mettinger. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to speak with our community and share some thoughts. You know, we heard a couple of comments and questions about transportation at our last meetings, which are, you know, duly noted that there are concerns our parents and our communities experience. And, and I think there's a couple of things that are important to, to go over at the onset. One is that we have over 400 bus routes within the district. As many of the board members mentioned, we have over 16,000 students um, across 19 schools coming in at a variety of different times and approximately 415 bus routes. All those bus routes were accounted for. And if we, there weren't routes that we were providing the services for internally with our own drivers and our own um, vehicles, we had contracted and contracts with bus, bus vendors for each of those routes um, for the start of school in September. The problem was, as you are, may or may not be aware, there's a shortage of uh, many of employees, um, you know, not just bus drivers, you know, people to work at stores and retail and some fast food places and Amazon and things like that are hiring people. And it really had an impact in our community in the area of transportation and bus drivers. So um, shortly after the start of school, we got notification from one vendor that they can no longer honor their commitment for almost 50 routes. Shortly thereafter, we had another vendor that said they couldn't honor their commitment for two routes. So it was about 52 bus routes you know, where children were scheduled, slated to come to school, all ready to be, um, you know, uh, getting on and off at their bus stops each day. And all of a sudden they were no longer able to provide that service. So what we did was we triaged and we're still doing that and trying to make sure all those students that are required to have transportation by state law, which is over two miles for an elementary school student from the school and 2.5 miles from a high school, for a high school student. And we were pretty successful in managing that. It took a little bit of time in getting those students accounted for and getting them on buses and consolidating routes that weren't totally full with the vendors and also using some of our internal um, transportation drivers as well as our buses who've done a great job in being very flexible. And then just this week, um, we were informed that another vendor on a daily basis informs us every morning at five o'clock or so, sometimes later, that they cannot accommodate between 10 and 20 additional routes on a daily basis. That's a really um, or audacious task to manage every morning and try to fill those routes and get those children picked up into school reasonably on time. And we've been managing as best we can. It hasn't been 100% um, successful because we can't. We just can't do that. And that one particular vendor who has been doing that, we actually met today. And we said, we need to consolidate those routes you have so that we can't manage that on a daily basis. The shortage of drivers that you're having, you have to manage better on your end. And we have a plan in place where hopefully when they have the shortage, it'll be um, a much smaller number of routes that we could manage on a regular basis. Um, we've done some other things, such as I know people that watch the board meeting or attended. Uh, we're right now leasing eight buses from the Somerset Regional Services Commission. And those are 54 passenger buses that we're using to consolidate some of our routes because not all of our internal buses, of which we have about 30, are 54 passengers, many are 24. So that doubles our capacity and we can join some together. But we can't just pick up twice as many students. We have to do that with our software program within reason because we have to coordinate those routes. You can't be on the bus for 45 minutes. You know, if you're going from um, Roxy Avenue down to John Adams, right? That shouldn't take 45 minutes. So we have to make sure we have those routes and the people are put on the right place. And it takes a lot of time. It takes time to figure that out. So I understand our parents' frustrations because I feel the same way. Um, I, I want to hold those vendors accountable. And at some point we will. And if legal action is required because the contracts weren't on, we will take that. But in the short run, we're still managing and triaging to try to get all the children to school. So some of the questions we've had um, are related to subscription routes. And we have right now today over 2000, about 2100 students that are subscription students that are on buses that are currently on. Um, sorry, something just happened with my zoom Ralph. Am I still good there? Okay, something on my end here. Anyway, um, about 2100 students that are subscription buses that are on on those buses and they've been placed on those buses since August. And you know, one of the options we had when we had these vendor shortages for the required bus routes 
was we could have just said, oh, we can't honor those subscription and refund your money back. Um, conversations I had with the board president and in my own mind, I didn't think that was appropriate to disrupt those people that had already were slated or already on buses, even though we don't, we're not mandated to transport those students. They did pay, they were on the buses, so we kept it. And then, you know, we, we've been managing ever since. And for those people that put in subscriptions after that and weren't yet placed on the bus, this is where many people are frustrated. We have about 1600 parents who've put in applications, a little over 400 who have not only submitted an application, but a check. We didn't cash them yet, but they submitted a check. And um, we're doing our best to accommodate them, but we have to do the students that are required transportation first. And I sent out correspondence about a week and a half ago that said, once we get into October, I think we'll be able to do it. We're going to start revisiting the subscription busing, which we are. And then we had this other vendor that started dropping between 10 and 20 routes a day. So it's taken our time to do that. So I can appreciate everybody's frustration. I'm as frustrated as you are. Um, we're doing the best we can and we're going to try to, we have, we're continually working on the plan and try to revise it. And um, we're fighting against what seems to me sometimes to be an overwhelming tide that just keeps coming in no matter how much water we keep bailing. And uh, we're gonna keep doing that until we get it resolved. So I, I just had a follow-up question. <clears throat> so you said <clears throat> that one of the drive, uh, one, of, um, one of the vendors uh, dropped the routes after school started and children had been, so are they, can they just do that? I mean, once they already have the drivers, can they just decide to one day not, uh, you know, not come at all? Um. And my short answer, Mrs. Matagor, is no, they can't do that. You know, we have an obligation. They have a contract. They were awarded a bid. They provided a bond. Um, but at the end of the day, there's, I agree with you. you. You signed on to do this. We have a contract for you to provide the service. The students were scheduled. We're on that bus. We're on that route. They, a couple of these routes had already occurred a couple of days before I got that notice. And uh, it was around Labor Day, that uh, Monday or Tuesday. And my, my, my short answer is no, they can't just do that, but they did, you know, and, and the response from the vendors is, listen, they're, they're not being malicious. They don't have the drivers. They just don't have them. They may have taken on more uh, responsibilities than they were able to honor, which they shouldn't have, but and I can't speak to that. Um, but if the drivers simply are not there and there could be political reasons, unemployment, all that, I don't know. I don't really care because it doesn't matter. They're, they weren't, they're physically not there. Um, we're going to try to hold them accountable as we can with the legal recourse and what we can do because we did sign a contract. We did have a, a bond for all these bids that were awarded. But at the end of the day, we'll see where that goes. Then in, in the meantime, we just want to do all we can to get our students to school as best we can. Thank you, Dr. Bregan. Ask about the, uh, the bid test. Yeah, just uh, one second. I cannot see, I cannot see the, um, all the participants, so I don't know who's raising their hand. I cannot switch to the gallery view. I think there's some technical issues here. Um, also, I'm not able to see the chat. <clears throat> so, Ralph, I'm still out of sound, right? So I, I can answer. The, okay. there, there was a question I believe that was out there because it, it came to me if it wasn't one of your questions, uh, okay. Mr. Matagor, about lateness in the transportation. And it's pretty much always been a standard policy that if a bus is late to school, the kids are not held accountable. You know, in, in the secondaries where the lateness really matters, right? If they add up to, to cuts, depending on how late you are, you don't want to lose credit for the class. If any students are late to school because of transportation issues, whether their bus didn't come or it was late at the bus stop, um, they will not be held accountable and late for that class. That's an ongoing expectation. If someone does has an issue with that, they should contact the teacher or the principal, and I would imagine it would be uh, remediated. We did talk with a few principals because individuals reached out to me, and they said, yeah, that's not a problem, Dr. Green. We will definitely make sure they are not marked late because it's beyond their control. And I also know the principals at some of our, our secondary schools in particular have been more flexible, not only with just students that are not, um, that are being transported by bus, but other students because of some of the busing issues, more parents and more cars are on the road, which makes an already crowded um, process more crowded with more vehicles. So they've been definitely more understanding. And typically even in a normal year, when we have all our transportation needs met, um, it takes a few weeks for everyone to find their groove, right? For the parents that are dropping off their students and picking up and students that are driving to get that right time frame, So we do get a little more efficient 
as time goes on. Um, <clears throat> so, Dr. Bregan, you have the chat in front of you. Can you just, uh, because I can't, uh, I've lost my connection. Okay, I'll see if I can pull it up. Um, someone just let me know that there are several PTO meetings today, and that's why the uh, it's limited participation. Yeah. Um, uh, so if anybody has a question, <clears throat> please um, type in the chat and we'll call out your name because uh, I'm not able to see you. Or raise your hand. Okay, now I think I can see. So if anybody has a, so Gabriel Holler, you can speak now. Ralph, can you unmute him? No, uh, Please unmute yourself, uh, Gabriel Holler. It says it's not, okay, now he. There you go. No, it's still muted now. It says it's not allowing him to unmute. Okay, now you're unmuted. You can speak now. Hi, how are you, everybody? Good evening. How's everything going tonight? Um, I just had a quick question. Uh, we were talking on some chats. I spoke with some other parents, um, trying to figure out uh, what the total number of unenrollments from the school is this year so far. I know that Dr. Bregan was working on some numbers and I know it might be more of a fluid list, more than concrete. Uh, just wanted to know if there were any uh, numbers on that range. I'm assuming what you mean by unenrollers are the people that elected to homeschool rather than send their child to school. And if that was what you were asking, as of today, um, it's about 125 students. Any, anybody else has any questions? Please raise your hand. I'm not able to see the chat, so if you could raise your hand. Amit, you can speak now. Hello, good evening, everyone. Um, so I did reach out to Dr. Bragan just as of yesterday, and this is in relation to uh, the congestion in parking at JMI and JMP for pickups. Um, Dr. Bragan did respond back to me, so thank you, sir, for taking time to do that. Um, and uh, unfortunately, I mean, this is the fifth year that we are going to that complex. So, um, it's not the first year that, you know, I've, I mean, I've not reported this before, but this is the first year that I, I think it's gone beyond, uh, reasonable time that we have to spend for the pickups from that complex. Uh, there are three schools as Dr. Bregan, you responded correctly. And, you know, uh, you know, I, I'm, I was just thinking about solutions, right. As, as to what we can do. I know we have a problem. Um, I'm sure you, it, it's on top of your mind. Uh, but is there any flexibility in adjusting the school dismissals for JMI or JMP that could alleviate some of the problems? And we're talking about like maybe five minutes. We're not talking about you know changing the full schedule for the day. Is that even an option? And a couple of other options I was thinking out loud was that there's a um, there's a nonprofit organization Edison um, First Squad Number Two on New Dover Road. Um, and that parking lot has about 30, 40 car uh, parking lot capacity, which is normally empty. Um, could we reach out to that organization for usage of their um, parking lot for, you know, about, uh, about the dismissal times? Yeah, those are great, great points, Ahmed. And, and like I said, uh, in, in the past life, I was a, a principal at uh, James Madison Intermediate School. And uh, it was a crowded situation back then. And it, you know, basically we actually talked about it as a committee a little earlier before the meeting. It's a school, a campus with three schools on it. There's one road in, one road out. Um, you have the staff parking on there. You have one of the bark, the uh, bus parking lots there. And then you have the parents parking somewhere in the middle. And I know even back then, um, as the administrator in charge of that building, I had to actively manage arrival and dismissal being out there with, uh, we had staff members too that would do that. Um, to make sure it moved 
the traffic flowed in an a, um, expeditious pattern and also the kids were able to cross safely when their parents dropped them off and there was no uh, danger with cars and um, buses in that area. The, there's a couple issues. One, we actually talked about it years ago about having staggered times for JMP and for JMI, right? Because the one's uh, K to 12 and one's the three to five, um, K to two and a three to five school. There's a few problems with that. One is a contractual problem that the teachers for elementary schools all work the same times. Now, I'm not saying that's insurmountable because that's something we could work with our association who's always been collegial with us if we wanted to make sure the amount of time was the same. That I don't anticipate being an issue, but that would be something we'd have to negotiate as a sidebar. But the larger problem is many of the students that attend those schools come from the same families. So even if you made a 15 minute difference, that means um, a parent would have to go there perhaps twice and the transportation would be a problem too because when I pick up at the route, I used that example earlier down on Roxy Avenue there and I'm picking up uh, you know, Miss White, Miss Podofsky and Mrs. Conway all from the same family and one's at JMP and two are at JMI, I pick them up at the same time. So, cause I drop them off at the same location. You know, one's obviously the primary school, one's at the intermediate. If we staggered those times, that would require a totally additional run. So while on the surface, that answer seems plausible, hey, let's just stagger those times. There's a little bit more involved in trying to figure that out, but we'll explore all those options. Um, and the other one regarding the first aid squad that's on New Dover there, that's, that's something we could look into. I know when I was there, even though we didn't have permission or the authority that we did that on a regular basis, parents typically did that anyway. Sometimes, you know, parents find the path of least resistance to get in and out as quickly as they can and would use that anyway and walk up the walkway there and pick their children up. And we talked earlier about going behind that complex on McKinley. I'm sure there's a lot more traffic on that road than there typically should be on the day you know, during arrival and dismissal that people are going to walk up the path there. So, um, Amit, I, I, I feel your pain and uh, I understand the congestion there. We, we will continue to look at seeing what we could do to, you know, try to ease that congestion. Um, Dr. Bacon, there was a similar question, um, actually an email I received and I'll just read out the email. Um, this is on um, traffic also. Um, and um, the parent wrote to me that Washington school drop off has been unsafe for the last nine years and has increasingly worsened now. Today, a police officer came, parked and never left his car. Even at 345, when people were still illegally parked in no parking zones and blocking homeowners driveways, nothing was done. Uh, this causes crossing the street to be very unsafe for all, including the crossing guards. So I just wanted to um, you know, uh, bring this up, uh, that this has actually, um, and I guess the parking is becoming even worse because of the busing issue. And um, one of the suggestions um, that, you know, I can think of is how about if we are able to open the school buildings a little bit earlier so that um, parents who are actually driving their kids uh, can actually drop them, even if they can drop them like 10 minutes earlier, if that, that time, uh, then that would help in reducing the amount of traffic because it's literally a nightmare right now. I mean, I, I do that every day, I see it every day. It's a nightmare just getting your kids to school. And so if, if that could be one of the options we could explore, it's just opening the buildings earlier. Um, can I respond to that? Yeah, sure. Uh, being a parent of uh, three students going through the district, uh, the Madison complex has been a problem for many years. And we have tried uh, many different routes. You can either do the walkthrough that brings you to Stratford Circle. There's the walkthrough that will bring you to McKinley or there's the uh, going out onto New Dover Road with a crossing guard on the, uh, right there at the entrance. I know it's um, a problem. I experienced it many years ago and it, it, it is a problem. It's the number of students coming to each of the schools turns out to be a problem. But we did talk about um, bringing the students in a little earlier. We did talk about a five minute differentiation of the, the primary school to the intermediate school where the primary got out a little earlier and then it went on to JMI and then it went, went off. So. No offense, 
we've done it all at the various schools. At Washington School, many of the parents get out and stand there and wait. Whereas there's, if there's no large enough parking lot, that in <clears throat> itself has always been a problem at Washington School. And we can't build a parking lot. So it makes it a little more difficult all around. And now with the busing issue and more people driving, I'm hoping that as one thing is settled, other things will also slide into place. But I can tell you these things are not new to the various schools. And we have tried many of the different try to try it. Uh, going back to Dr. Kresge and Dr. Caprero, uh, we've tried many different things. It's just, we need to try our best. And I think, I believe it's the busing issue that's been the main problem this year. And once we solve that by getting more buses involved, getting more drivers for those buses, it will alleviate more parents from driving to the schools. And it might be a, a good practice. So one thing I just wanted to mention was that Today, uh, some parents shared a picture of Edison High School um, hallways, and it was very, very, very crowded. And I think what is really happening, especially at the high school, is that all these kids are going to school, and they're all waiting outside the door. And as soon as the door opens, it's like the floodgates open, and everybody's going in together. So from that perspective, even for the high school, if one could do that, and I think those kids are older, so that you don't have this swarm of kids going in at the same time, especially in COVID times, that might, might just something to explore. Now we have a few- Just on, if I could add yeah, something. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, the Washington school issue is an issue and I forget if, that, if that's still called Winthrop there, I forget, but mm -hmm. you know, it's on the corner Winthrop in, in um, Cambridge, I believe. There's just no, as Mrs. Conway said, there's no parking there and there's no opportunities to place any parking. That is truly a neighborhood school in the middle of the neighborhood. Even when staff come in, you have to come in that one lot and go out the other one on Michael Road because there's just literally not any room to turn around to do anything. So I imagine, well, I know when the parents come to drop and pick off their children, there's just not enough room there. It just is what it is. And to exacerbate that problem, this, this shortage of labor is real. It's across every industry. You see the shortages in the automotive industry, the shortages in construction. We can't get materials, they can't get people. We also have a shortage of um, crossing guards and we're trying to work with our police because currently they work directly with the police department. Um, they have 60 spots a day and they have 30 people and police officers, as you might've said, there was a, a police car there all day because the police officers are often filling those crossing positions, which isn't the best resource to use for a police officer, but they fill in when they can to make sure the roads are safe for the children to go back and forth. So it's a conglomerate of all these things, you know, coming together at one time that are just impacting us. And uh, I'm hoping that, you know, we're riding the crest of this wave and it's gonna crash soon and things will come back to some degree of normalcy and we'll be able to address it. One of the things you mentioned though, about coming in earlier, we'll look into that because that's an option. Um, the problem is coverage, right? We have to have people that are willing to um, supervise children at any age. You know, I have three daughters that are in college now and they still should not be unsupervised for too long a period of time. Um, and we wanna make sure that we have people that are willing to do that, right? And, you know, there is a contract, we would have to pay them extra, which is totally fine. We would do that. Uh, that may be an option for some of our older kids to come in earlier and have, um, maybe make it a productive, you know, a breakfast club for homework or something like that. If that helps, we'll look into those options. Yeah. Okay, so the next person is Brian Rivera. Can you unmute yourself? Good evening, everybody. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. I wish you all well. I hope everybody's having a wonderful night. Uh, my question, I was just curious, um, with enrollment, how many students are still not enrolled? And are we offering after hours, um, whether it's after hours or weekend, to get these kids enrolled? Is there a plan in place? And if so, when will it be instituted? Dr. Bacon. Yeah, sure. Um, we, we gave a report on the enrollment at our last board meeting. And as at that time, um, all the students that were pending enrollment were fully enrolled. And the only ones that aren't enrolled now 
um, typically are missing paperwork. There's no backlog anymore. Everything's caught up. Um, they may not have an immunization issue or have the documentation and that will be dealt with on an individual basis. We did talk to um, when we were going to debrief on the whole enrollment process for this year. And one of the things we talked about was at the end of the summer, extending the hours, perhaps even providing some weekend time. You know, obviously we'd have to make sure the staffing, we could accommodate that with uh, extra remuneration, but we want to make sure we're being more customer friendly. And, you know, one of the easiest things was, and we didn't think about this in advance, so I take full ownership for that, but we had those two holidays off for religious obligations and we were closed. That would have been a perfect time to bring staff in that, you know, we would have to pay them extra if they were working on the holiday. Um, but we didn't have the, uh, the normal busyness of even this building with the education process and the schooling taking place that on those holidays, we could have perhaps caught up a little more quickly. Okay, the next person I'd like to call is Jana. Can you un unmute yourself? Hi. Uh, hi, uh, I have one question. Uh, so uh, I had a discussion with uh, JMI principal that uh, if we go to uh, Canada or Mexico, uh, the kid has to quarantine once they came back because it's uh, international travel so but then uh, principal told that the quarantine period for the kids will be counted as an excuse uh, leave so yeah is it, is it amended from the state or because uh, kid is not going to uh, be in a school he's going to be quarantined but he can't use uh, any any remote work or anything but if class is going to be quarantined due to covid in a positive case in a school uh, the kid, that class or the close contact will get the option, but not the person who is traveling and has to quarantine because of the travel. It's a great question. And I'm going to answer the beginning of it and then I'll pass off to Dr. Al Dorelli, our HR director, who's been dealing with a lot of the uh, COVID case examples. Um, we, we do plan to follow the restrictions for travel, whether that's international or within the state, as they uh, sometimes are changing with this COVID virus, right? Depending on the pre prevalence of the virus in the community, in the nation, and in, you know, obviously in the world, if you're talking about international travel. Um, but I will tell you this, and I'm going to, Dr. Adderall is going to finish up. You know, our attendance policy, really the idea for our attendance policy is to make sure students understand they need to be in school to learn and time when they're away from the classroom, their teachers, instructional processes is time lost. And there, there's actually state requirements on how many days they have to actually be present to be promoted for the following school year. So we have a policy in place that tries to limit absences to those that are obviously uh, only absolutely necessary for illness or family obligations or whatever may happen. Throw in the COVID-19 variant and all of a sudden we have a different world. And sometimes kids are absent for reasons totally beyond their control, whether that's an exposure level, whether that's something with travel, which obviously if you're a child, you have no say over whether you travel when your parents decide you have to go somewhere, whether that's a family obligation or parents work commitment or whatever that may be. So at any time, when those situations occur, there's always an appeal process. If you should somehow go over the allotted amount for absences, absences, whether that's at the secondary level or elementary, there's obviously an appeal process that's built into our attendance policy. And you would, you would obviously invoke that. And I could honestly say that I don't know of any of our principals that if you went over that allotted time because you had to quarantine or we made you quarantine or, or the state guidelines or federal guidelines forced you to, um, that we would not uh, make an adjustment and you would be fine and, you know, get credit for that time and not help hold it against you. Dr. Alder. Yeah. Um, just to kind of piggyback uh, on what Dr. Bragan had said with regards to the actual protocols and process. Uh, currently there are no restrictions for domestic travel here in New Jersey. Um, we do abide by the CDC recommendations for um, international travel. Uh, and that would be for unvaccinated uh, students and staff members. Uh, only in which um, obviously any type of international travel in order to uh, get back into the country or leave, uh, you would take an, uh, a COVID test, whether that's rapid or PCR. Um, then the requirement based on the CDC recommendations would be to quarantine for a period of 10 days. That can be reduced to a total of seven days in the event that they receive a negative COVID test three to five days after their date of return. Um, and Dr. Blaken, just related to the absence, um, what is the school absence policy at this point? Because 
I keep hearing a lot of people, like especially now, you know, cold coughs and things like that, and people don't know right away whether it's you know COVID or it's especially for the unvaccinated elementary school students and uh, maybe sixth graders. So if somebody is not feeling well and they decide to not go to school, um, so then what is that excuse? Like how do how do we treat those absences? They say the toughest questions for you, didn't they? Um, um, you know, attendance is always an issue and it's always a concern for, for our, our community because obviously we want to make sure people are in school and they have to be here in order to learn and, you know, avail themselves of all the educational programs that we have. You can't really do that home. Although during COVID, we thought we proved you could do it remotely, but that's a whole nother conversation. Anyway, um, you know, our attendance policies are in place. And there's very few things that are considered, and this may be where the miscommunication or the misunderstanding came with that gentleman's conversation with um, our principal, is that there are very few things that the state considers an excused absence, very few. And we, so we don't consider anything typically excused, right? You get up to the number, and let's say it's 20 number, 20 days you can have absences before you're in a, in a status where we're going to review your situation. Technically, none of those days we consider excused, but then they evaluate it. So let's say 10 of those days you were home for sickness or you thought you may have had COVID. Um, we're not going to hold that against you. We can't because we don't want people to come to school when they think they may be sick, staff or students, vaccinated or not. If you think you may be sick and potentially have COVID, stay home. Um, parents and staff, we've said this, we want you to err on the side of caution because we don't want um, to bring people into schools that could possibly spread COVID to people that aren't vaccinated. And we've been pretty successful so far this year. We've had cases, we've had exposures, we've had quarantines, but as I think we said earlier, we, we have 16,500 students, approximately 2000 staff members, and we've had very low numbers. And part of it is many staff are vaccinated. Many of our older students are vaccinated in the classrooms, in the buildings, people are being vigilant about wearing masks. And they're also following our protocols. If they feel ill or sick or have a fever or two of the symptoms that would be considered potentially COVID, they stay home and they get a negative test and come back to school. So in any and all those cases, well, it may provide us um, uh, more work to sort out you know, what's real, right? Because in, in any situation, some people may manipulate that system to take more absences than they really needed. And we have to vet those out too, right? Because it's not fair to the students that come to school. But we would much rather have people err on the side of caution related to this virus until we can totally say that, you know, the COVID-19 is truly in the rearview mirror and a thing of the past. Uh, another thing related to the same issue is the tardy. Um, and I don't know if we discussed this because I was trying to look at my uh, iPad and figuring out when it was having technical difficulties. Um, so what's happening really is that um, a lot of buses obviously are getting delayed. So people are going to the bus stop and waiting for the buses and then the buses don't show up and then they are going to drop their kids to school. And obviously given the traffic, they can't necessarily get there on time and then those kids are getting tardy notes uh, because those buses are actually ultimately reaching the school. So can we have some type of a relaxation there as well? Because I feel that you know, the kid is already stressed out because now the bus right. didn't come and now they're dealing with the traffic and now they go to school finally and, and they get a tardy note. A hundred percent. We hit on it a little bit, not that specific question while you were working on the computer. Huh. Um, obviously, anyone that comes on a bus, any student has no control over when that bus gets there. So if that bus is 15 minutes early, that's great. If it's 15 minutes late, it's not your fault. We would not hold that against you. And I do believe all of our principals in this time where we're just starting to get back to school. And for some people, they have not been in a classroom, school, since uh, March of 2020. So just getting back to school, the routines of getting here on, not only on time, just getting here, right? And what it takes for you to get up in the morning, get to school and, you know, be presentable and walk into the classroom on a normal year without all these other added things may be difficult for some of our people who haven't done that in a long time. Mm -hmm. So our staff have been overwhelmingly, and the expectation would be to continue to be flexible with that. Add to that buses that are, are late, that are maybe aren't going to the right stops or maybe not coming that day. And you were waiting to get picked up and your bus didn't come. Now you jump in a car with a neighbor or a friend or a parent and drives you and you're late. The expectation would be that we do um, 
relax those late and tardy rules so we don't add more stress to the day. Yeah. And if somebody has an individual concern with that, please bring it up to their principal. Mm -hmm. And again, it's unfortunate because there may be some people that may manipulate this to choose just yeah. to come late every day. And we'll have to vet those out too, because that's not fair to everybody else. Right. I mean, everybody has a, you know, a record. I mean, it's not the first year they're going to school. So uh, <clears throat> one can always look at that, but, you know, we don't want to penalize students who have absolutely, tried to, kind of absolutely really tried to um, navigate the process. So I can see some questions uh, on, on the chat. Um, and um, so there is one, which is, um, there's somebody talking about the food. And I think I keep, uh, we keep seeing things on the social media. If you have any food related issues, then please um, email the board and, uh, uh, and that's how we can take care of it. Uh, and Dr. Baker, if you wanna add something to that, to the process. Yeah, absolutely. I, I know, uh, I'm trying to see the chat so I can't get it up. So I'll rely on you, Mrs. Matago, to share that with me. Um, we changed food vendors as you may or may not know. We're now working with a company called Machios. And um, they're doing a great job and they're trying to get acclimated here. It's, it's a big job. It's a big district. They did a transition very quickly over the summer. And um, I, I would be lying if I didn't say there were some bumps in the road as there is with any transition. But the feedback that I've had, the majority has been positive. You know, sometimes there's some negative feedback too, and we take it. And we've met with Machios on two separate occasions as a group and an administrative team to share that feedback with them to help us get better and improve. I'll give you one example is one of the schools we went to and uh, we saw the distribution. You know, some of our cafeterias in our secondary schools are large. We, and we have a, a large number of students that are trying to get their food to eat it in a short period of time and do it as efficiently as we can. And there were some things, suggestions that the principal myself gave to the uh, food service company, which is Machios. And to make that more expeditious, make it more, help um, enable students to get their food more quickly and more orderly. And, and they were very receptive to that. So um, I think it's going well. We're going to continue to monitor it. We're going to continue to work together. And like anything, when you're serving thousands of meals every day across 19 schools for a value of $3.30, it's a really difficult effort to make it really good, really quick, and get it done every day. 100% accuracy. Yeah, so my suggestion just would be to email, um, and, you know, rather than share on the social media, just email so that, you know, somebody could take a look. And um, can I just say that that's a great thing too, Mrs. Matter. If there's a question about anything in the schools, and depending on your child's school, your first contact should be the teacher. Hey, my child's lunch, I heard he didn't get it in time. They didn't have enough chance to eat, you know, in elementary, secondary, maybe more of the guidance counselor because they may have a variety of teachers, you know, no one's there at lunchtime. And if, and if that doesn't meet with satisfaction, go to the principal, because those are the people that are on the, the front lines. And the, you could always send it to me. And the first thing I do is I call the principal and say, hey, were, were you aware of this? And he or she will tell me I was, I wasn't, and I'll get more information and then I'll get back to you. But you can cut me out and just go right to the source and you'll probably more likely get an answer. Right. Uh, so then I think there's another question on, um, on having more staff at lunch, but I think that's already a problem because of staffing issues. Uh, because The uh, staffing issue is, is, is pervasive across all um, industries. And that's one, you know, we had, um, when the company came in the summer, they offered all the prior um, food service providers, employees, the opportunity to work for us. And they did get a, many of those people, um, but they are understaffed right now. If you asked me today, maybe 10 or 15 staff, they're working hard to try to find them, to get them, to hire them, offering bonuses to get people. And um, yeah, they, we are not fully staffed in that capacity. Yes. While talking about uh, while talking about lunch, somebody had uh, uh, text, texted me and asked about the tents. Uh, and they wanted to know if we were uh, in the process of getting tents. I did respond that it was something that the administration was looking into, but um, have we gotten any closer to getting them was the question that they had asked me. And I said, at this time, uh, I hadn't heard. Have you heard anything? Because um, some of the parents liked the idea more so of the kids yeah, getting outside and getting mm -hmm. more of a chance. Uh, to spread out, and that was giving them a chance. Have we gotten any closer? It's a great question. question. Yeah, I, I wish I had a better answer, but um, 
when we tried to get tents for the beginning of the school year, they were hard to come by. And the few companies that offered the option to do it similar that we did towards the end of last year was very expensive, more than double the price. So we put out a bid for, for tents. It was on the last board agenda. We right. opened the bid and nobody bid it. So I think it was Mrs. Matagor suggested, you know, why don't we look at purchasing those kind of permanent structures that we could put on the sides of the buildings? And we're still looking into that. That's going to take a little bit more time. But again, as we, we mentioned before we went public, um, there's a shortage of everything, <laughs> you know? So, mm -hmm. what, you know, what would make sense to me, those permanent kind of sale things on the side of the buildings, I don't know if I'm saying the right word, where you get the shade and they're a little more structured and permanent the can withstand. The they're kind of sales. No, they're okay. some type of cloth and they're yeah. like a permanent kind of tent thing. And uh, they would accomplish the task we want to have more outside spaces that are covered from the sun and the rain. Um, we're looking into it and trying to get it, but it's, it's hard to get those estimates to get the people out now because anything in type of construction, things like that, they're, they're saying they're backlogged three months. So we'll, I, I hope that better news at the board meeting. So there is another suggestion here, and I think it's a great suggestion. Uh, so uh, someone is saying that it might be a great idea to actually poll the kids of the items they like and the items they don't like. Um, and, and food, I mean. So, uh, so then they can actually get more of the stuff uh, the kids like. And you know, we could, use, we could use the data from different schools um, also, and then kind of compile everything so that you know, we get a better sense of what, what is more popular. Um, it's a great idea. Yeah, and, and then there's another question, and I know there's one hand up, and I'm gonna call you right away. Just give me a two, two minutes. Uh, there's another question. When a child is quarantining or out on COVID, we report it attendance differently. If a child is tardy for busing, teacher was informed. Oh, sorry, this is somebody actually responding, I believe. Um, all right. Uh, so I'm going to call on Gabriel Holler again because he has, he's the only one with his hand up right now. Can you unmute, unmute yourself? Gabriel Holland, yeah. Hi, can everybody hear me again? Yeah. Hi, thank you. Sorry, I, I muted myself after the last uh, question and uh, I couldn't get back on. <laughs> so I'm trying again. Um, just a follow-up question to the uh, unenrollments. I know Dr. Bregan had said it was about 125 students. Um, do we know how many of those students are special ed students? Anyone that's received uh, services through a 504 or an IEP? Uh, and the reason why I ask is because um, it's going to be a very difficult situation to get those children back in school, because once they enroll, what's going to happen is they're going to go right to a gen ed class. They're going to have to wait the 90 day waiting period for eligibility. They're going to have to get tested all again for all their services, uh, which could be a very sticky situation. And it's something that I'm actually dealing with now in the district that I work in. There's several students who have reentered and it's become a gigantic mess. Um, so just trying to see uh, if there is uh, any um, leeway uh, with maybe allowing the students who have unenrolled uh, for this year to see if we can kind of roll over or push off the re-enrollment uh, and having to file an entire new IEP if possible. Dr. Bacon? Yeah. Um, it's a good question, it's a specific question. Um, depends on, it really depends on the length of time the student is unenrolled. So I'll give an example. Let's say it was one of our students who had an IEP and a specialized program, whatever that program was, self-contained class and class support out of district program, whatever that may be. And for whatever reason, they decided to homeschool or disenroll for a period of time. If that period of time is weeks or months, um, I would not see a reservation for us when the child does. And if they do re-enroll, to re-enroll re them in the exact same program in which they were in. If you're talking over a year, you know, it's like accounting. You have the short term and long term. Anything less than a year is considered short term. If you're going longer than a year, I think you, you may have to get that testing done because you're not really sure on the accurate program for a child that was homeschooled for a year, potentially or more. And you don't know what um, exactly their capabilities would be at that point. So. I think it's a specific question, depends on the situation, but if given the flexibility in a short period of time, which in my mind is less than a year, um, their program that they left should be the one that we try to replicate, at least until the time 
that we can decide whether we can meet their needs or they have different needs as, as that has evolved in the time that they were homeschooled. Okay, so there's another question on the number of students quarantined. The question is, how do you collect the data for the number of students quarantined? Dr. Adara? How do we collect the data? Yeah. Each, each incident with regards to um, a student that either tests positive or is quarantined as a result of a contact either in school or at home, um, what happens is all that information gets filtered through their point of contacts. In some buildings, it's the building principal or the vice principal of the school nurse. That information will be communicated to our office, and then we report that information to um, the Department of Health uh, here in Edison Township. Um, that information is then kept on file with them. Uh, we keep a list of the number of students. We're also required to report uh, basic demographic information, name of the student, point of contact, so that sometimes the, um, the Edison Township Health Department does additional contact tracing. So just another related question to that. If uh, there are siblings in the house and one child um, is uh, positive, COVID positive, and the other child has not been tested yet or the result has not come back, so then uh, do both the kids automatically get the supplemental instruction or do you, the second kid has to come to school? Now, both students would see receive supplemental instruction in that capacity because the student that tested positive is a student of Edison Township. And as a result, their sibling, who's also a student of Edison Township, is, uh, quarantined. is quarantined. But as what well. if that sibling was vaccinated? Because our uh, policy says that. Yeah, so vaccinated students do not, do, not, do not need to quarantine. Um, so even if they have COVID? No. Different question. Different, <laughs> different question. question. Different question. If you, a positive test is a positive test, mm -hmm. whether you're vaccinated or unvaccinated. If you are vaccinated and your brother in the household tests positive, technically, as long as you are asymptomatic, you are not identified as a close contact. We always do recommend though, since they do live in the household, that they do get a COVID test um, as, as a precaution. Okay. So, I mean, I think um, if so, the parent would want, we should actually encourage them to stay home and you know get them the something i don't know that i think that might make sense because otherwise you'll be spreading it in school or, or have a negative test yeah or, or, have or, a negative or return test. with the negative yeah. test absolutely yeah, yeah. um can, can i can i bring some up because sure, i sure. might forget yeah. about it um there were some questions asked um i'm imagining this is more towards elementary about halloween celebrations and halloween parties and i'm going to ask uh, i'm going to talk a little bit about that i'll ask dr Al to really to fill up on that you know and some of the concerns would be Typically, in my um, reminiscing of my elementary days as an administrator and as a teacher, that um, Halloween's a big deal. It's a big day for children. We dress up, we do the parades, hopefully the weather's nice. We can march around outside and whatever school that we're in. And we would have a Halloween party. And that usually went over some overeating, right? Some probably inappropriate treats that weren't on the best nutritional guidelines. And that's probably somewhat similar to what our children would expect today. What I, I would caution our teachers and our principals, and we'll, we'll send out some correspondence to our community to remind them that while we, as I said earlier, we hope this COVID is, is gonna be in the rear view mirror in the short uh, amount of time, it's still not 100% there. And we probably wanna limit the number of people that are coming into our buildings, whether that's moms and parents and PTO moms. I know everybody wants to volunteer and be a part of their child's class, especially during those celebrations. But in, in light of, you know, where we are now and the vaccination status and some of the requirements, you know, for staff members, staff members as of October 18th and people that have constant contact with children, whether they're outside vendors and things like that would be required to be vaccinated or commit to getting tested on a weekly basis. We don't typically do that with parents, right? We don't typically do that with vendors that come in, in a one-shot deal, the guy that's delivering the water or something like that in school. So what we should do is be vigilant in the number of people we allow in for those celebrations, make sure mask wearing is, is, is definitely, um, um, that's the word I'm looking for, enforced, and, uh, and those kind of things to try to limit the opportunity for us to maybe uh, create a situation where we could possibly spread the virus. I doubt the really what I miss. Yeah, uh, no, um, it actually specifically references um, the idea of volunteers within a, a covered setting, which is um, our school district and how we should be treating volunteers. Volunteers um, and other workers that routinely visit the buildings 
are required to demonstrate vaccination status in some way, shape, or form. Um, a party, you know, for a specific holiday um, or activity, much like Halloween is coming up, would be a volunteer or somebody assisting with the classroom as a one-day component, which wouldn't really, which wouldn't necessitate um, providing documentation for that. But um, just to echo uh, Dr. Reagan's sentiments as well, too. As we've spoken with multiple members of uh, the administrative team, our building principals, um, especially at the elementary level. As a former elementary principal, I understand the uh, um, the excitement ar around Halloween too. So correspondence will be coming out with them, with you know not only the number of people that are going to be permitted in the building, but also safety measures as we watch those parades too. Social distancing, mask wearing on the premises. Great. Uh, so there is some feedback from a GMI, from, from GMI parents. Thanks for taking care of the open wire box on the path to school. It's safe now. Uh, just please have landscape people to please trim that tree which blocks the half of the narrow path. Okay. So, uh, and then we have uh, Brian Rivera who has his, uh, who has raised his hand. Brian, can you uh, unmute yourself? Hi again, I was just listening to the conversation, so I just wanted to make it clear. So I know Washington School is doing a uh, chunk of treat on school premises, I guess, right there in the parking lot. So anyone attending on school property, they'll be required to wear a mask. Is, is that what you're saying? Because um, I, I, was, I was just curious if it's inside the building or outside. Yeah, great question. No, that's not what I was saying. You know, the uh, parameters, as I understand, the mask mandate, mandate is for indoors. Okay, so I just wanted actually to make a, sure. A trunk and treat celebration is a great idea for the, for the children in the classrooms to do it outside, right? And even though there's not a lot of spaces for cars and trunks at Washington, I'm sure we'll somehow manage that. No, the outside, you know, the regulations say that um, it's not mandated for outside. And you know, when our kids go outside for phys ed and other activities and a day like today would be a great day to have a class outside, right? It was a beautiful day. Um, you could take a mask break, take your mask off, try to stay more than six feet apart. And we would encourage that for our, obviously our volunteers that come to the building as well. Um, and then there is a, another question about which board members are assigned to which schools. Uh, I think uh, initially, um, we did not even have the information on committee assignments on our website, so it might be good to kind of have that information available also. I think it's on there. I, I don't think the board member assignments. Is All right, there. I'll double check. Um, Remind yeah. me. That. So, and I think this year because of COVID, uh, you know, just uh, somehow those PTO meetings didn't happen. Yeah, sure. In person and stuff like that. So I think we don't have any other hands that are raised, and we also don't have. I don't think I have missed any questions that were posted. So I'm going to just ask, because we have a few, two minutes actually. So I'm going to just ask uh, Dr. Alderelli how uh, all this testing is going on at JP and Edison High. And typically if somebody wants to get tested, <laughs> is there a waiting period or do, do they get uh, appointments right away? And how many students, uh, you can answer. First. Sure, sure. Yeah. yeah, currently right now we have, uh, we have testing at both high schools, uh, JP Stevens on Tuesday and Edison High School on Friday. Reminders are going out um, via the messenger. Uh, weekly uh, with the help of Mr. Benedict and his team. Um, there is a registration process which is communicated within that correspondence. You must register first in order to get um, the uh, scheduling link as well too. Uh, once you register, uh, you will then be provided, you'll be prompted to go through a series of steps, enter some demographic information, and then you'll be provided with an opportunity for um, a scheduling link to schedule a time at either J.P. Stevens or Edison High School. Um, we are currently looking right now, um, based on the numbers, the, the number slots have been filled recently over the course of the last two weeks. Uh, we are in conversations with Back to Work Solutions to perhaps extend that time frame. Uh, we're gonna go in slow in increments to make sure that, um, that the demand also warrants, you know, an additional 45 minutes or an hour and a half. Um, but uh, to my knowledge right now, uh, people that have wanted to obtain a scheduled vaccination on campus have been able to do so. But it's just the, the two days. Is there a feasibility of doing one on a, um, say a Monday? We are looking to do that on a Monday and to um, also maybe differentiate the time period. Currently we do uh, afternoons right now. So we're currently talking with the company 
maybe a morning might be more beneficial, some time frames between 10 and one, um, maybe a little, little bit later on in the evening. So um, we've actually gotten some feedback, not only from some members of the staff, um, but uh, uh, some parents have also reached out to building principals as well too. So we're currently kind of coordinating just to make sure that the time frame that we choose is conducive to the majority of the people's schedule. And is there a cost to this? Uh, there is, uh, so for, um, there, there is no cost associated with this. So when you're entering your demographic information and your insurance information, your insurance will pick up that, that they'll, they'll go through the insurance company. Any billing questions at all though, there is information on the Back to, the back to Work um, Solutions website. They'll handle any billing fees in the event that they are, you know, provided with a bill by mistake. Thank you. Yep. And I think that brings us to eight o'clock and I would um, ask uh, any of the board members if they wanna have uh, any kind of closing comments, please. Okay, I just was thinking uh, back to food service, okay. Um, I was wondering if it would be possible and I think some buildings do this already. They have like a student committee who critiques the food, who critiques the service. And um, they come up with very good suggestions. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe if it became part of student government, part of student council, you know, maybe we could um, get some really good input from the students themselves who were the most important through this. So it was just the thought. Yeah, I think it's a great thought. Um, I think the feedback should come from the students because mm -hmm. they, are the, they are consuming the food. So. You know what's great, what's good, what's not that great. You know, and so where do we need to improve? Yeah, what's yeah, you know? Yeah. I think it might be helpful. Yeah. Although uh, I think they're doing a great job. <laughs> yeah, I recall uh, meeting with some of the elementary schools uh, years ago when I was on the food service committee, and I want to say they called it a yak, and I don't remember what it stood for, youth advisory committee or whatever. And they actually met. And I met with um, third and fourth graders and we had the menu up and the children were actually picking out what they liked, what was the best, how could we improve? And it was uh, a very good session. And I believe that I thought it was at most schools, if not all of the schools that they met and they um, got back to the administration uh, with their responses. And that came in handy. And I was probably the pickiest out of anyone in the group. Uh, surprise, surprise. And uh, the children had a wide variety and they showed what they liked and what they didn't like. So hopefully if it's not going on now, that's something that we need to uh, bring back because no offense, what I like versus what the children like who are eating it may be different. You couldn't get a chicken nugget in me if, if you paid me $1,000 a nugget, but that is very popular with children. Pizza has to be a number one item. And as a parent, I'm a very picky pizza person. So if you're asking my opinion, I'm not the one that's eating it every day. So I really valued the children's uh, opinions because they were the ones eating it. So that is a great idea mm -hmm. that if it's not being done, we need to bring it back. Thank Good you. Good idea. And I would never believe that you were the most picky, Mrs. Conway. I, I don't believe that. Oh, no, no, not her. Chicken Caesar. <laughs> Touche. Karen, you want to say something? No, basically, I agree with both ladies. It's um, an idea whose time has passed, but has come again. Um, we had the committee and I know um, people I worked with were in charge of the committee and work with different grade levels. And the committee could be a little different at different grade levels. The high school students, you could have students from our family and consumer sciences group who are in foods classes meet with them. But then at the elementary, it's just, well, we like this. But whatever, it gives a buy-in to all of those students for wanting to buy lunch. It's a great idea. Mm -hmm. Elizabeth, you want to say something? Closing thoughts? No, I, I would just like to thank you for continuing this committee. And hopefully uh, 
with the suggestion we can branch out to do in person if the community would warrant it. It wouldn't have, you know, it wouldn't be all of us, but we could bring back the information getting from individual PTOs to this meeting. And it would be another way of communicating because this has to be a number one asset to the Board of Ed that we are reaching out and showing the community that we truly care about what they think and get their opinions. We may not agree with all their opinions as a board and an administration, you know, we, there are things we have to do, but it's good that we're giving people a chance and through Zoom, it makes it more convenient for many people to um, voice their opinions or ask questions that where they may not be able to attend board meetings or PTO meetings. So this, this is working very nicely and I thank you for that, Shivi. Uh, thank you to all uh, you know, committee members I and mean, this committee would not have been possible without you know, any of your suggestions. And as we had discussed at the beginning, this was basically, this committee was initiated to engage the community, you know, to uh, engage in this meaningful discussion where we could hear what was going on uh, you know, on the ground because sometimes you, you feel like everything is going on great and until you hear from people and then you realize, oh, this is not working, that is not working. But this um, forum is not just for uh, you know, just coming up with uh, you know, just criticism or uh, just you know, things like that. I mean, we appreciate all, all the comments and you know, all the questions you have and you know, you're happy to kind of be here as a resource. But it would be great if we can also get your suggestions and ideas on how to, you know, be become better. And I know that you know we've had some of those thoughts and comments shared with us, which you know we try to share with everybody. So you know we might not be able to implement everything, but it's good to kind of keep hearing those uh, good thoughts and keep hearing those great ideas because at some point we'll be able to. And uh, so thank you for joining in. And um, uh, I want to thank Dr. Bregan and Dr. Alderari once again for making themselves available. And, and to Ralph Barker, who does, you know, who's always here. And I just want to remind everybody that you know, we meet periodically and our next meeting will be on October, oh, sorry, November 11th uh, at 7 p.m. So November 11th, 7 p.m. We will again um, see you on Zoom. And till then, um, you know, have a safe um, um, rest of, uh, of uh, no, October and November. Thank you and good night. <laughs>